for joining us tonight. We pray that you are um, doing well and we hope that you have a, a wonderful evening. Um, so I'm gonna ask you now to go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Exodus chapter number 31, where we're gonna begin looking at uh, another name of God tonight, uh, Jehovah Mekodesh, Mekodeshkim, Mkodesh is pronounced another way as well. Um, and you'll find it again in Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 through 18. And the name means the Lord who sanctifies you. The Lord who sanctifies you. Now, just as a way of recapping um, all that we have uh, been looking at over the last several weeks, we have been looking at this idea of learning the different uh, self-disclosing names of God, uh, the self-revelatory names of God, the names that either God revealed himself by or the name that people came to understand God by as a part of their own discovery of God. And so what we want to do tonight is look at lesson number nine, the ninth name of God. And we hope and pray that this is going to be a wonderful evening for you. Good evening, Angela. I see you, Barbara Bowling. Deja Howell, good evening to you on Facebook as well. So um, let's go ahead and jump right into this again. Uh, Jehovah, we've learned this now on several different occasions. Jehovah is translated to mean the existing one or the Lord. Uh, and the, that's the chief meaning of the name uh, Jehovah. It means uh, uh, to be, uh, another meaning for Jehovah is to be or to exist. Now we said before that Jehovah uh, uh, designates uh, this God that we serve a God who reveals himself unceasingly to us, that God is continually revealing himself to us in the journey of our lives, that we might be able to discover God in fresh and in new ways. Now, M. Kadesh Mekodishkem, another name, another way to pronounce it, is derived from the Hebrew word Kadash, meaning sanctify, holy, or dedicate. And so when we talk about sanctification, the Lord who sanctifies you or the Lord who sets you apart, sanctification is the separation of an object or a person primarily for the dedication of God, that God separates, that God sets apart a person or an object primarily and specifically that it might be dedicated to the Lord. Now, when we think about those things that are consecrated or sanctified or set apart, we usually think immediately to those things in the Old Testament that uh, were uh, uh, elements or components of the tabernacle, those the, the shoe bread and the candles and those things on the altar, that those things were typically set apart for God's use. They were not to, to be used for ordinary and common purposes. They were holy artifacts set aside to be used by a holy God for holy purposes. We don't always think about that sanctification or that separating or that dedicating aspect to our own lives as we do as to the objects that we read about in scripture. Now, when you combine those two words, Jehovah Mekodishkim together, it means, it's translated, the Lord who sets you apart. Now, when we look at Exodus chapter number 31, the first thing I want you to understand tonight is Exodus chapter number 31. It is a part of the Exodus narrative. So in order to really understand and appreciate what is being taught here in Exodus 31, beginning at verse 12, you have to keep it in the context for what it is presented. It is a part of the Exodus narrative. So therefore it has a specific and, a, and an important meaning to us, uh, how God wants us to apply that to our own spiritual journey. Now, um, beginning in verse 12, we now begin looking at the instructions for the Sabbath that God sets apart for God's people. Now, let me say this in order to keep it in the context of what it means that the nature, the meaning, the intention of the Sabbath, that is an urgent check on the ideology of productivity. 
that when they came out of Egypt, they out of, out of out of Egyptian bondage, out of oppression, what was governing their lives was this was this uh, this ideology of productivity, because productivity in the text is rooted in a myth of scarcity, that whenever people begin to believe I don't have enough then I will always be working with the mindset or with the objective to get enough. And so when they were in Egyptian bondage, uh, this, uh, this myth of scarcity was used, this ideology of productivity was used as a way to justify uh, the empire having great surpluses. So what Pharaoh did was Pharaoh made it seem as if the people would never have enough, that he took away the straw that they used to make bricks. So therefore he made their, their, their times hard, but he also forced them to be more committed to productivity over and against anything else. The empire, the, the empire that they were brought out of, the worldly system, the worldly empire that they were now delivered from acts as though there is not enough, acts as though there will never be enough. Therefore, the supreme virtue or the supreme purpose is in producing and accumulating more. Now, let me pause right there because it's imperative for us to understand that whenever we adopt this mentality that I never have enough, something is going to be jeopardized. Something is going to suffer as a result of this mentality, this ideology of scarcity. And so what God does at the tail end of his speech with Moses, at the tail end of his conversation with Moses, what God does is God begins now to set the record straight, if you will. He begins to lay for them the foundation that they would need to have as they move forward in their relationship with Almighty God. This was not going to be this abstract journey, but this was going to be a journey that was going to be rooted and their willingness and their commitment to be obedient to what God was laying out for them to do. It is not a subject or a passage of scripture that we automatically or readily go to, but it's one that is very important as we begin now to lay the framework for, for this, this idea of the Lord who sanctifies you. Because you have to understand in the simplicity of our relationship that God has brought us out of the world to be dedicated unto himself. God has brought us out of the paradigm of quote unquote slavery that we might be able to share in relationship with God the way God intends for us to be in relationship with him. Now, uh, several points of significance. Let's begin to read beginning at verse 12 in Exodus chapter 31, and then we'll touch on some of the points of significance in the text, and then we'll draw away or pull away some important highlights for us to hold on to as we journey ourselves. So beginning at verse 12 in Exodus chapter 31, where the word of God reads from the New Living Translation, it says, the Lord then gave these instructions to Moses. Tell the people of Israel, be careful to keep my Sabbath day, for the Sabbath is a sign of the covenant between me and you from generation to generation. It is given so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. You must keep the Sabbath day, for it is a holy day for you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. Anyone who works on that day will be cut off from the community. Now, let me pause right here to say that God is really not going to cut you off and kill you because you don't honor the Sabbath. This has spiritual implications that we'll see as we go further on in our lesson for tonight. We're going to see exactly uh, how this plays out as we move further in this teaching on tonight. Verse 15, he says, you have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day must be a Sabbath day of complete rest. Hallelujah. A holy day dedicated to the Lord. Uh, anyone who works on the Sabbath 
must be put to death. Again, the reiteration that what God is saying. Verse 16, the people of Israel must keep the Sabbath day by observing it from generation to generation. This is a covenant obligation for all time with the people. Uh, that this is a permanent sign of my covenant with the people of Israel. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. But on the seventh day, he stopped working and was refreshed. Verse 18, when the Lord finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant written by the finger of God. Now, when we look at verses 12 through 18, uh, several points of significance that we have to lift out of here uh, that pertains to this idea about the Sabbath day. First and foremost, the Sabbath is a sign between God and God's people. The institution of the Sabbath was a display of God's favor to the people of God. And it was a sign that God had distinguished them or that God had or that God has uh, qualified them to participate in God's own life. Don't miss that. That the observance of the Sabbath reflected their duty and their obedience to God. That God was calling them into a place with God. He was calling them into a place where they were going to now be forced and challenged not to have a mindset of constant productivity because they were being seduced to the ideology that they that that if long as they did not have they would have to work in order to get now remember something here god rested on the sabbath day and god did not rest because god was tired god did not take a break because god was tired Everything God did in six days, God did not have to do anything on the seventh day. The importance about the rest does not speak to what God did, but the importance of the rest speaks to what God is calling us into. That by, by telling them it was a sign among him and his people, among God and his people, the Lord was letting them know through Moses that God's favor was on them and this opportunity to come into a place of rest qualified them to participate. Here it is, to participate in God's own life. I want you to look at something now because it tells us in the text that God, look at verse uh, 17. Uh, it is a permanent sign of my covenant with the people of Israel. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. But on the seventh day, he stopped working and was refreshed. So what God is letting Moses know here is that there's going to be, there's got to be a point, a time in your life that you set aside to do nothing else but to rest. And your resting is a sign that you are in covenant of relationship with God. It, the, the, the opportunity to rest says God has qualified you. Here it is to take a break because God himself, the life of God, when you look at the life, if you will, quote unquote, life of God, the cyclical life of God in the early part of Genesis was one where God worked and then God rested. And so what he's telling them is that I'm bringing you into a place where you are now able to participate in God's own life. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And Jesus himself even participated in the life of God when Jesus would steal away just to rest. And this idea that I've got to work and work and work and work and work is not a biblical concept. There it is right there. It is not something that God would desire for any of us because what God wants for us to do, hear me well, is to participate in the cyclical flow of life that God has communicated to us through the word of God. So first and foremost, it is a sign uh, between God and God's people. So we, we set aside that one day of the week to go worship, amen, Sunday. And the Sabbath in the scriptures was not on Sunday, it was really Saturday, amen. 
we set aside that one day of the week where we go to worship as a way to quote unquote, participate in the life of God. Now, uh, uh, I, I, I'm gonna touch on this later on as we get further in this, because what I want you to understand here is that the idea of rest is really a concept of worship. There, there it is right there. Anybody who says they cannot rest really does not understand or value the significance and the privilege of what worship really is all about, amen. So first of all, it is a sign, but then secondly, it is holy to you. In verse 14, it's, God, the word says, you must keep the Sabbath day for it is a holy day for you. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. Anyone who works on that day will be cut off from the community. Now, when I was growing up, my grandmother used to always tell me, she used to tell us that you don't work on Sunday because if you work on Sunday, God's going to take a day from you during the week. It was a way, and when I was young, it frightened me, it scared me because I thought that if I worked on Sunday, God was going to snatch another day away from me. But that's really not what she was trying to parlay to me. Her, her, her theology was somewhat correct, but how she communicated that theology was not all the way right. God is not going to kill you if you work on Sunday What God or, or you refuse to rest. What God is letting us know is that you will now begin to self-destruct. Oh, God help us. You will begin to self-destruct because what God wants for you and for me is to be able to participate once again in the cyclical flow of God's life. So it is, it is designed, the Sabbath day, the day of rest, it's designed for your benefit, but it's also as a way to honor God that the Sabbath was made for man. God, God created that day of rest so that man might come to a place of rest. I wish I had somebody who would just say rest. Amen. Now, now, in order to fully appreciate this, in order to appreciate this, again, you can't, don't take it out of context. Don't take it off the pages and then try to tell somebody the Bible says you don't work on Sunday because that's not what the Bible says. It don't say you don't work on Sundays. It says that there's a day of rest. Amen. A day of rest that all of us should have as a part of our journey, as a part of our lives. It's a day and a time of rest. It does not say if you work on Sunday, you're going to get a slap on your wrist. Amen. I'm trying to help somebody here now. It doesn't say that. What it says is that, that there's got to be, you're going to work six days, but you have to have a day of rest in the calendar, in the journey of your life. There ought to be one day where you set aside some time to rest. And what that simply means is that when I'm resting, I am still participating in what is called worship. Now, this statement, God gives Moses this statement, these instructions in the, against the backdrop of the Exodus story. And what the Sabbath suggests to us, the Sabbath suggests resisting the production values and production rewards of Pharaoh. This the Sabbath, this is God's way of letting us know that I'm going to provide you another way to live your life where you don't have to be consumed by the delusional values and the delusional rewards that Pharaoh wants you to uh, uh, adhere to in your life because those empty values, those empty rewards will ultimately end up in you going back to a place of slavery. You should never be a slave to time. Oh, God, help us right there. I just said something right there. That ought to help all of us. And I'm going to confess tonight because I had to take a break this past week, amen, because I was doing and going and going and going. And the first two days, I did not even know how to act, amen. I didn't even know what to do. I, didn't, I, I couldn't find anything to do. And my wife and my son just said, just do nothing. And I had a hard time doing nothing because I was always used to doing something. And because and what, what I found out was I had become a slave to time. 
that time was dictating my movements. Oh God, not and not my relationship with God. Woo. Oh, I just said something right there for somebody. Amen. That ought to help my five of us tonight. See, so so what God is letting them know tonight is that that if when 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 you begin when you begin to allow time and 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 the empty values and the empty rewards that quote unquote Pharaoh or the system places on you, you will find yourself ending up in a place of slavery. And what he's telling them now is that you profane, by profaning the Sabbath, what it simply means is that you are now jeopardizing all that is most precious and, 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 and definitive about their existence, that they were now going to uh, jeopardize who they were as a people, as people of God, but they were also going to jeopardize what defined their existence and their loyalty to God. What defined them was who God was to them. What defined them, hey, darling Davis, what defined them was who they were as people of God. They were not to be defined by Pharaoh. They were not to be defined by the context upon which God brought them out of, but they were now being brought into a new covenant relationship that had covenant uh, 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 guidelines, if you will, to this whole uh, relationship. So the, the Sabbath was going to be a sign for those who just joined us. We were in Exodus chapter number 31 tonight, verses 12 through 18. That the Sabbath would be a sign that existed between God and God's people, but it would also be a holy time for uh, the people of God. Uh, and then thirdly, it is, uh, it is uh, a time of rest. Somebody just say rest. Uh, it is a time of rest, holy to the Lord. It is separated from common use. See, there are days, there, there, there are moments in our days where we do what we have to do. But when you set aside the time where you're going to spend with God and you're going to just rest from God, it, what you're saying is that this moment of time right here, whatever day it is, now hear me well, it is not, it, it is not reserved or, or, or contextually referring to Sunday. It is not referring to the day that you go to church amen, and sit in that lovely pew and wave your hand at the right spot and say amen at the right spot. It is sim simply saying that you have to have a time in your life where you are stepping away from the world and you are committing yourself to spending time with God. And this time is going to be a holy time. Remember now, all those things that were set apart for God's use, they were deemed holy and they were not to be used for common purposes. They were not to be used in ordinary ways. That you ought to have at least one hour of your day. Help me somebody. If you can't have all 24 hours, you ought to have at least one hour of your day. When you set aside some time where you and God are you just sitting back and you are resting and your rest is, an, is a testimony or a reflection of your worship. Because by observing this command, what God is letting them know and letting us know tonight is that we are being taught to rest from our worldly pursuits and the service of the flesh. Oh, Lord. How many of y'all listening to me tonight can honestly testify that you have spent a whole lot of time, sometimes too much time working and not enough time tending to your own physical, emotional spiritual well-being. Amen. He says tonight that when we observe this command, by observing this command, we are taught tonight, they're being taught to rest from the worldly pursuits. Now, remember now, you got to understand it's important for you to catch this because God is telling them this against the backdrop of what Pharaoh was making them do. All Pharaoh wanted them to do was to work and to put their flesh into the service of the oppressor. But what God was now calling them out of that thing to do was to devote themselves to having a time where the glory of God could be reflected throughout their lives. Oh boy, I just said something right there tonight. 
Amen. That what God, because remember now, God brought them out. I'm going to take you back on the journey because when God, uh, when God told Moses, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. God told, told Pharaoh, tell, God told Moses, tell Pharaoh, let him go three days journey that they may worship their God. The entire premise of coming out of Egypt centered around the people of God being able to worship their God. God delivered them from oppression for the purpose of worship. Oh, God, help us tonight. And so that's why it's important to understand that we have to rid ourselves with this ideology of productivity. Remember when Jesus came and Mary and Martha and, and, and one sister came and sat at his feet and the other one was working, was working, was working. And she was like, tell her, come in here, help me because I got too much to do. Amen. And Jesus said, no, she's taking time to do what is best. Oh, God. And sometimes, there it is right there, my brothers and sisters, sometimes you got to stop and just sit down at the feet of Jesus and take yourself a Sabbath rest. Hallelujah. And bless his high name. A Sabbath rest. Because if you don't, if you don't take control of your time, you will become a slave to time. Now, again, the backdrop is one where God brought them out of slavery and God did not want them to go back into slavery again. So when Paul gets into Galatians and said, uh, uh, it was for freedom that Christ died, for our freedom that Christ died. And so when you've been brought out of bondage, when God has delivered you from bondage, God does not want for you or for me to go back into a place of oppression, but God wants us to live in the, in the sweet union and the sweet communion of God. That's why God delivered you in the first place. That's why God didn't deliver you so you could just spend all your time trying to get more. And I hear you saying it right now, but Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and that you may have life more abundantly. He did, but Jesus came for your spiritual well-being first and foremost. He came not to satisfy your fleshly desires. He didn't die to satisfy our fleshly desires. He died to satisfy our spiritual need. Amen. So when he talks about giving you life and giving you life more abundantly, the idea there is that he wants for us to be replenished and to be restored and to be renewed spiritually in the journey of our lives. So here is God. Here is God laying these instructions out for Moses that after you have after you have uh, constructed the temple, after you've gotten the money for the tabernacle, after you've gotten the plans for the incense, after you've gotten plans for the washed basin, after the anointing oil has been constructed, after the priests have been dedicated, after all that stuff has been done, after all the ceremonial stuff has been done. Now God gets down to the nitty gritty that God says, after you've done all the work, there it is. After you've done all of the work, I'll say it one more time. God says, after you have done all of your work, set aside some time that you may rest. Somebody just say rest one more time. You ought to just say, Lord, get, help me rest, Lord. That's my prayer for each and every one of you tonight. Help them rest, oh God. Help them rest in the harmony and in the beauty of what this relationship we have with you, that it might provide them and provide all of us tonight as people of God. Now, can I, can I take you a little deeper tonight? Can I take you a little further tonight? I hope you don't mind. Amen. Now, why this is important. This, even though when you read these, these six verses, seven verses, it might seem like that it really has no bearing on my journey. It might seem like I don't even understand why God even put this in here. It may seem like what is the relevance for this being in scripture? And remember, I told you before that everything in the Bible has spiritual significance to our lives. Everything in scripture has spiritual significance and spiritual relevance to who we are as people of faith. Now, the first note of importance that we find tonight is that what this passage does is this passage communicates to us that a life, life that cannot imitate the creator and rest is the end, is in the end, a life of self-destruction. 
when God says, hear me well, when God says, when he tells Moses that I worked for six days and I took a Sabbath day, one day to rest, this passage of scripture tonight is letting us know that a life that cannot imitate the life of God, cannot imitate the life of the creator, cannot imitate the creative life cycle of God is a life that will ultimately end up in self-destruction. That you, Because what happens is, is that God now becomes pushed on the periphery and the fringes of our lives. We were created to be in relationship with God. God was not created to be in relationship with us. We were created to be in relationship with God. So therefore, your life and my life, there has to be some balance to this thing that we call life. You cannot work yourself to death and then think you're going to have a healthy and vibrant spiritual life. You cannot work yourself to death and believe you're going to be strong spiritually because that's an oxymoron or a contradiction to the portrait of how God lived, quote unquote, lived his life in Genesis chapter number one. So if you and I are going to avoid, avoid having a self-destructive end, remember now, the Bible says there is a way to a man that seems right. But the end thereof is death. And you and I might think we know the best way. We might think we know what is right. We might think we have all of the best ideas. We might believe we have been seduced at times into believing I've got to work harder and work longer and do more. Because if I don't, I'm going to miss the earth. That old saying, the early bird catches the worm. And that, uh, that whole statement implies to us, I got to be up early and be about it all day long. Because if I don't, somebody else is going to get ahead of me. But can I bless you real quick? If you don't take the time to cultivate a, a, a worship life with God, a meaningful life with God, then you are going to, you ain't got to worry about nobody else getting ahead of you because you're going to self-destruct on the other end, all because of your own doing, all because of my own doing. So one of the things we got to take away tonight is that uh, the Lord who sanctifies you, the name, he sanctifies you, he has set you apart not only to be holy because he is holy, but he has set you apart to participate in his very own life, in the very life of God, a life that consists of activity and a life that consists of rest. It is not either or, but it's both and. The Sabbath suggests, again, that we have to now, we can no longer allow the empty values of Pharaoh's system to dictate how we move and live our lives. And what I want you to get, if you don't take any notes tonight, take this note down right here, that the main point about the Sabbath is not worship, but the stoppage of work. Amen. Because what happens when you, if you think about, if you think about it just from the standpoint of worship, you fully don't understand the real meaning of rest, okay? <laughs> See, what, when I think about, when I think about the Sabbath being a stoppage of work, a stoppage of work, doing nothing. What it does is this level of awareness, it invites all of us to rethink what worship really means to us. Because in this context, in this context that God is giving us tonight, worship is God's creation engaged in joyous rest. That we are called, God is calling us to enjoy a space where we can enjoy God cultivate a space where you can enjoy God and worship is a place where you enjoy God. Again, it is not about you being in a particular building on a particular day to 
Act as if you are in worship. That is going to worship. That is not participating in worship. Say it again, preacher. I think I will. That is going to worship. And a whole lot of people go to worship, but not everybody practices worship. We go because we have, we don't fully understand the real definition of worship. Worship is really not an activity that I do, but worship is a state of being that I'm in as I commune and relate to God. Meditation is another aspect, there it is, Angela, of worship, that when I can spend time with God and meditate on God and let the Spirit of God and the Word of God uh, speak to my heart and to my mind, I am now enjoying my time with God. I am in a place of actual worship. And I would dare say that a whole lot of us have really minimized the significance of worship because we don't always immediately gravitate to spending time with God outside of the activity of going to spend time with God, if that makes any sense to you. See, worship is a place where you can enjoy God. You can be in your house with the the sound off sitting in your chair and allowing your mind to just reflect on the goodness of God, allowing the Holy Spirit just to speak to you. And when you start thinking about what God has done in your life and a tear rolls down your face, you ain't done nothing, you ain't doing nothing, you are now engaged in what we call worship. What God, how God defines worship. Somebody ought to just say, help me worship, oh God. Help me worship, oh Oh God, he's telling them now that you must keep the Sabbath day by observing it from generation to generation. Verse 16, this is a covenant obligation for all time that what God is trying to let us know tonight is that we are supposed to have in our, in our daily routines of life carved out a space and a time where we can enjoy being in the presence of of God without having to do or go anywhere. Oh, that is wonderful. Because listen, God has set you apart. God has sanctified you. He has set you apart that you might be not used for ordinary common use, that you are to be used for holy purposes. And there's nothing more holy than being in the presence of a holy God, hallelujah, and bless his high name. So the first order of, of importance tonight is that number one, that a life that cannot imitate the life of the creator in rest, hear me well, in rest, that if you cannot imitate God in resting, you're going to end up self-destructing. You're going to end up destroying your own self. Secondly, the main point about the Sabbath is not so much about worship, going to a place, but it's about the stoppage of work. Because when you, when you rest and do nothing, it helps you redefine what worship really is to you and to me. It's about finding a place where you can enjoy God. The third point of importance tonight is that the Sabbath for us God is trying to help us come to a re-understanding or help us to redefine the ultimate purpose of life. Can I bless your neighbor real quick? Life is more than going. Life is more than the hustle and the bustle about getting things accomplished. Life is more than checking off that to-do list because can I tell you something? When you close your eyes for the last time, you are still gonna have things that you did not get done. I can't get no help tonight. You, when you close your eyes for the last time, there's still going to be things that you did not get done. So if, 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 if trying to check off everything on the to-do list is how you define life, the Sabbath is designed to help redefine for all of us what the ultimate purpose of life is all about. The practice of peaceful, and I'm gonna quote this now, at homeness, quote unquote, with God, brings us to an ultimate quote, at homeness with God. That when I begin to practice being at home with God, 
It brings me to an ultimate place where I am really at home with God. I, I wish you could, could grab that. Amen. When I, when I practice being at home with God, it, it helps bring me to a closeness with God that I did not have before in my life. When I practice setting aside time to being at home with God, amen, it brings me to that ultimate space of what it really feels like to be at home with God. This, this my brothers and sisters, has, has a hint of an eschatological and end time kind of connotation to it, that me spending time with God here now is preparing me for what it's going to be like when I spend time at home with God in eternity. And if you don't know how to spend time with God in time, you're going to struggle spending time with God in eternity. Because if you are not the kind of individual now who can just sit back and reflect and marvel on the holiness of God and the goodness of God and reflect on the nature and the characteristics of God, you're going to have a hard time when you get to eternity when all you do all day long every day is reflect celebrate, honor, and glorify who God is and has been in your life. Amen. So this whole point about I got to get to the next thing. No, sometimes you got to stop and sit down long enough and say, speak to my heart, Holy Spirit. Send me a word, oh God. Remind me of what it means to be close to you. I just want to be close to you is what I want to do. Amen. Amen. Now, um, if I knew you could handle it, I'll give you a little bit of something a little well, I'll give it to you anyway, amen, so you can take it with you tonight and chew on as you sleep. I want you to look at verse number, at verse number uh, 18, because uh, there's, something, there's something significant and poignant about that particular verse. It says to us, when the Lord finished speaking, okay, when he finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant written by the finger of almighty God. Okay, the tablets that were written, that were written with God's finger, written by the finger of God, what it does is this entire act right here, it brings the children of God, it brings them now into a new level of covenantal obedience. God is now letting them know that I am now dictating the terms of this relationship. Ooh, Lord have mercy. God, God, I'm not leaving this to Moses. I'm not leaving this to Moses to, de to, to decipher or to dis discern or to tell you. But God says, I am the one who is now defining the terms of this relationship. Now, if you have your Bibles, if you turn back over to Exodus chapter number eight and verse number 19, what you're going to find there is you're going to find that phrase finger of God and used in a previous context. Because in chapter eight, verse 19, um, after this was the plague of the gnats and the, after the magicians uh, tried to do the same thing and they could not do it, the gnats covered everyone, people and animals alike in verse 19. They say, this is the finger of God. Now, God does not have hands. God does not have fingers. Uh, so what we see here is something called anthropomorphic language. It is language given to us to help us relate to or understand a God that is beyond human comprehension. That's number one. The idea that God has eyes or ears or feet or hands or fingers. God has none of those because God is spirit. So what the writer does is he uses language to help us gain an understanding of this God that is beyond human comprehension. So it's an anthropomorphic way or usage of words. But the finger of God is significant because in chapter 8, verse 19, God's finger disp dispatches nets and defeats the pretense of this empire that thought it had all the power. God uses a, his finger, if you will, to dispel the myth 
that existed in the empire that said the empire had ultimate powers. Now, what the Nets represent, the Nets are a part of the story of liberation, okay? Y'all with me? Y'all with me? The Nets are a part of the story of the liberation. That remember the plagues that God sent. All those plagues made up the story of their liberation. So you see God's finger at work in the storyline of their liberation. And then it says here, the finger of God writes on the stone tablets. And the same finger that was used in the story of their liberation is now the same finger that's used to give them this law, the Torah, the laws that Moses would come down off the mount with. And so these, these laws were, hear me well, the laws were not rules to restrict them from living. The law was rules to help govern how they lived in this new community. Why is that important? They had been in bondage for 400 years. They did not know what being free meant. All they knew was how to live as enslaved people. So God gives them rules because God has now established this new community. And so his finger not only is a part of their liberation, but his finger is a part of their reorganization. God, help us tonight. And what you see here is by the words, his finger, the finger of God, God is now acting powerfully and decisively to make new liberated covenantal life possible for a people who once were subject to nothing but slavery and oppression. I hope y'all got that tonight. Amen. I hope you don't miss any of this tonight. Amen. Because it should help us understand why our time of rest is so important. Now, the end of God's speech, this is the last thing God says to them, the end of God's speech on that mountain before Moses comes down. Because in chapter 32, Moses comes down and there is the golden calf that the people have erected. So Moses has been spending time in the presence of God. God's speech, the end of God's speech, suggests to us that the Sabbath belongs as the final question of faith and as the final goal of human existence that the final ultimate goal for human existence is to live in covenant relationship with Almighty God. It is to live in harmony with God in such a way that we, uh, that, that, that we incorporate in our own lives the very life of God. That in Him, I live, I move, and I have my being that what God wants for us to understand tonight over and above anything else is that our living with God, our journeying with God, our coming out of bondage, our coming into this covenant relationship with God is one that our, the final question of our faith rests in. I, first, I'm going to spend at, at some eternal resting place, I'm going to spend ultimate time with God. I'm going to be able to rest ultimately in a place with God where time won't be an issue to me any longer. But then secondly, while, but while I'm waiting on that time to come, while I'm waiting on the final question of my faith to be resolved, I now have to deal with the final goal of my existence in living here. And that is to live in harmony with God, incorporating the life of God into my own life. And then lastly, the issue of Sabbath is first and foremost a spiritual issue. Hear me well. This is not about you or me adhering to tradition or routine or certain kind of rituals. That's not what this is about. So many of us believe that because I practiced the routine of going to church, and I was guilty for a long time. If I went to church, I was fulfilling my obligation to God. Amen. And that's not necessarily the case because you can go to church 
and never spend quality time with God. And what God wants us to take away from this tonight is that when you look at the totality of your life, when you look at the 24 hours you have been given in a day, when you look at the 60 minutes that you have in one hour, when you look at the 60 seconds that you have in every minute, how much of your time is quality time that you are spending with God in a place of worship? This is not about you or me adhering to these practices, these routines, these traditions, these things that people have said, oh, you, because oh, you know church folk will look down on you in a minute if you miss two or three Sundays in church. They will swear out, you don't know God no more if you don't show up in the building. <laughs> I can't get no help tonight, amen. They will swear out that you and God ain't friends no more because you don't come to church. And that's not what God is teaching us tonight. What God wants us to know tonight is that the, the issue of importance here is not whether or not I set foot in a building. It is how I spend time with God in a place of rest where God is allowing me to participate in the life that God has ushered me into. The Sabbath is an act whereby we restore and we re-accept our proper relationship to God and our proper relationship to God's creation. Again, it is not about you or me spending all of our time trying to do. What the Sabbath does is the Sabbath is designed to break us free from this ideology of productivity that I've got to be doing and I've got to be going and I've got to be at it, I've got to be getting it. Because if I don't get it, if I don't do it, if I ain't doing it, then something's wrong. And that, that people will look down that you lazy. Hey, ain't nothing wrong with spending some time and doing absolutely nothing. Amen, amen. If God rested, not because God was tired, God rested because that moment called for rest. And what God wants for you and for me is to come to a place in our journey where we can spend that time with God in a place of rest. And we can look back and say, this journey, this journey I have with God is an authentic one where I am spending my time trying to cultivate being at home with God that I might be able to experience what it really means to be at home with God. Amen and amen.